The whole purpose of figurative language is for students to understand they only use it if they need something to pop in their writing. We have a two-page spread in which I have secret formulas for different types of figurative language. You may want to grab a blank piece of paper to take notes here so that I can show you my secret formulas. First thing you'll see is imagery. With imagery, you want to first have that image. You're going to draw whatever it is that you want to create that imagery. You want the student to actually see the image in their mind using the five senses. So in this case, maybe I'm having the students, on your example there, want to draw the picture of a pie. We want to have the reader see that pie, smell that pie. We want to use imagery for that image in their mind. And what do we use? Adjectives, nouns, and verbs. In this case, we were looking at the pie. What image do we want? We want that sweet smell of the pie. So we always start with the noun. What is it that we're describing? That aroma. I don't want to use smell. When you hear the word smell, that word actually gives you this idea of something that's negative, that's an awful smell. So I'm going to use the word aroma. That's important that you tell your children that when you're doing imagery. The nouns you're choosing are critical. What feeling, what emotion are you getting across to someone when you say smell versus aroma? Smell, ooh, it's awful, aroma. Mmm, aroma, that's something that smells good. So we chose aroma. After that, we're going to ask what kind of aroma when we choose our adjective. Ooh, the sweet aroma. So now we're having an adjective. What kind of aroma would be coming from the pie? A sweet aroma. And then we go to our verb. What action would that sweet aroma be doing? Oh, it floated through the air. We are showing students not only how to create a vivid sensory image for the reader, but we're also showing them how to choose precise words that match that feeling we want the reader to have. And we have the sweet aroma floated across the room. Next, we will look at similes. A simile is two unlike things, but they have one characteristic in common. In our example, we were writing about a boy and how tall he was. So this is about a boy and what characteristic do we want to pop in the reader's mind? How tall he is. So then we ask, what else in the world is really tall? And that's when we came out with skyscraper. So we have our skyscraper here. And then we're going to use the words as or like to make this become a simile. The boy was tall like a skyscraper. The boy was as tall as a skyscraper. Now be careful about similes because sometimes when children find two unlike things going together to show the characteristic, they choose something that doesn't match the story. Let me show you what I mean. Let's say you're writing about gigantic herd of cattle and what characteristic do you need to reveal pop in the reader's mind? That they made the ground rumble and the dirt fly up all over the place. The cattle caused a rumbling sound as dirt flew all over the land. Now you need to ask what else would make a rumbling sound and make dirt fly all over the land? And you may have a student say, oh, a lawnmower, when it goes across a road that's just made of dirt. Well, the problem with that is, during the time period of this Western, they didn't have lawnmowers. When you have similes, you have to remember, you're not only looking at two unlike things, but it has to match the period or the story that you're telling. So in this case, maybe we'll say a twister. The herd of cows rumbled and caused the dirt to fly up in the air like a twister causing havoc across the prairie. The last figurative language on this page is personification. Personification is when a non-human or inanimate object is given human actions or characteristics. Let me show you my secret formula so that students can actually embed this in their writing. Our secret formula will be 
a noun, but the noun can only be non-human or non-living or an inanimate object. The verb is a human action. Let me give you an example. The noun is a chair. The verb, though, is going to have a human action. The chair squealed and hollered when the fat man sat down. Inanimate object, stars. What did they do? They danced across the sky. The car, as you can see in our example, strutted down the road. The pebbles whispered as the little girl scooted down the path. The dark alley grabbed at the boy when he walked by. Notice how personification is going to make this feeling in the story, this image, they are going to make it pop in the reader's mind. So if I had a character walking down a dark road and it was late at night, saying that the alley seemed to grab at him as he walked by, that's going to create that mood, that, that scary feeling through personification. When we look at the chair squealed and hollered as the fat man sat down, you're no longer looking at this man in a positive light you are now giving some sort of a clue to the reader that there's something negative here. Let's look at the next page for figurative language and the sacred formulas. We have symbolism. Symbolism is the use of symbols that will represent an idea or a belief, an emotion, or an action. These symbols are common in our society. Let's look at the example that I have on this page a peace sign. If I, as the writer, gave this as a clue, this symbol, that a character walked in the room, and as I was describing the character, I made sure that the reader knew they had on a peace necklace, it evokes certain characteristics about that person. Are they anti-war? Will I see them in a demonstration? It's a clue that you, the reader, can give someone. Notice also you have the symbol of a heart which reveals love, and insert them in your writing to give the reader clues about characters, about an idea, an emotion, an action to make your story even more deeper and developed. After symbolism, we have hyperbole. Hyperbole is an obvious exaggeration used to emphasize something or to have a larger effect on the reader. The secret formula for hyperbole is noun, who or what, are we going to exaggerate? Then we will go to the five senses. I have my noun, five senses, and then I'm ready to exaggerate. An example, my mom is the noun. What five sense am I using? What does she sound like? She yelled so loudly, now let's exaggerate. The roof shook. My mother yelling, that effect of her yelling, is going to be revealed to the reader through this use of hyperbole. In my example on the page, notice who or what was I going to exaggerate? The dog, what five cents? His smell, and then I'm going to exaggerate by saying he made the wallpaper peel. So I have the dog smelled so putrid, the wallpaper peeled. Next is an idiom. An idiom is an expression that doesn't make sense if you take it literally. Here's an example. If I say the big cheese, what you may picture is this person that looks like a big piece of cheese. But we know the big cheese means the boss. These expressions add interest to your writing. Over here we had you hit the nail on the head, meaning you're correct. So instead of the reader saying, you're correct, maybe they'll say, you hit the nail on the head. These expressions add more interest to the writing. One thing to take note of, if you read older books, sometimes you won't understand the idiom because it's been lost. We don't use it in our society anymore. Also, if you're not from the particular culture from which the book is written, you may not understand the idiom either. So idioms need to be used from the time period that you're in and for the audience that you're writing to. The last figurative language I have represented on these charts is a metaphor. 
Now a metaphor is a comparison, but it's when you're using words like is, are, and of when you make that comparison of two unlike things and you're comparing a characteristic that they have in common. The simile and the metaphor really end up having very similar purposes, but they're a little different because of how you word them. In our case here, we have he is, so we're using the word is, a walking dictionary. And from there you know, wow, he's really smart. But it adds more interest to say he's a walking dictionary. Or the car, so I'm talking about a car, is a lemon. So now you know, uh-oh, don't buy that car. It's not going to work. It's going to break down. But the car is a lemon adds more interest and quality to your writing than the car will break down. We also have represented here the word of. She is in a sea of trouble. So we're using the sea, how it's so vast and endless, meaning her trouble is vast and endless. She is in a sea of trouble. When we're using our metaphors, again, it's to make these ideas, these images, these feelings and emotions pop in the reader's mind. I've gone over seven different types of figurative language that your students can utilize in their stories. These formulas that I've shown you are concrete so that your children no longer are hearing use figurative language and they don't know even what it is or how to put it in their writing. With these formulas, what you can do is after you plan a Come Alive box, as you plan stories, you go back and ask, what needs to pop in your story? Let's add figurative language there. Let's use one of our secret formulas. I also suggest that you look at these secret formulas for reading. When you're reading and you notice the author used a simile, imagery, personification, any type of figurative language, you want to say to the students, oh look, they're making this pop in our mind. This is important when we're reading it. That way, you're not just using it for writing, you're using it for reading as well because they both truly are reciprocal. I hope you find these figurative language secret formulas useful for your children to write stories as well as to become better readers.